Les bifurcations, ce sont celles que nous décidons Now, dans nos propres vies. We... Parce qu'on a envie de lui donner à un moment donné un autre sens, parce que la vie personnelle évolue en pour quelqu'un, on a des événements qui font qu'on voit la vie autrement. Life in a different manner. Et puis il y a aussi from des événements, point of view, and then there are des événements that occur. internationaux, Now, can be international. évidemment euh, la pandémie a of course, the pandemic complètement bouleversé, totally chamboulé nos changed vies, our lives. elle les a transformés, it cha it changed them radically. It transformed la guerre our lives. que nous connaissons en Ukraine This nous a donné également une Ukraine lecture euh, nouvelle euh, du monde, des rapports de force, on croyait euh, appartenir à l'histoire ancienne. We thought we were just going, it feels like we're just going back to ancient history and this, euh, these bifurcations autre, in all of these cases choisi, have been chosen or that Alors you've been have subjected to. Now, perhaps you have to choose them before being suggested, subjected to them, but one maybe doesn't keep the other from occurring. And this is our inaugural conference theme, and this is the theme of this biennial, and starting from today until the 31st of July, for the very first time, we've decided to open this biennial for four months running, instead of one month, so as to better welcome Uh, audiences and view um, comers, uh, attendees, whether they be students or designers or business heads or employed people in the industry and services and local uh, government entities, whether you be just an amateur or you're a neophyte or you want to find out more about design, because design can change our lives. Well, we wanted with our teams here, Thierry Mandance and other teams, I'd like to thank him and his entire teams for the great preparation of this new, new year is to accompany each of these audiences or each of these festival goers or biennial goers so that they can integrate this to the best. 111 exhibits, 200, over 200 events, and as you can come many, many, many times and come back as much as you want. And this new year, this leaves the, tw the 12th edition. Eric Girdon, thank you very much for bringing in these students because we want the students to really buy in to this event in this emblematic site and throughout the metropolitan area and even the greater region. Welcome again to the 37 countries that are represented on this for this biennial, especially for the invited continent, which is Africa. And I, I think this is going to give us a new view of things and teach us so much. Now, since it's the very, very first day, I hope you have an excellent biennial, each of you. Now, enjoy this theme that's been offered to you today, besides what it just can uh, contribute to us on a cultural point of view, economic, phil philosophical point of view, an ethical point of view, I think this is going to really change a lot, create an upheaval up 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 in some of the certainties in our lives and make us different, and I do hope better, better people. So everybody, ladies and gentlemen, have a lovely day and a lovely biennial. Hi, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. I am just so pleased to be here this morning, so I can't say hi to you, each of you. Individually, I'd like like to thank our a great many partners, dear Thierry, the school, Eric, thank you so much. There's so many individuals from the world of arts and design who are present here this morning. And really, it just is so heartwarming. After this, as Ga Gaël Perdrio said, after this very, very long, dry period that we've all gone through, we're really, we were able to have a sneak preview with our partners of the biennial and we're really, really happy about the teams that have worked for three years on preparing this 12th biennial with this great backing that was appreciated by all. Now, just to go back to some, some of Gael Perdrio's words, this 12th biennial is talking about forkings or beef bifurcation. Now, this is, of course, very, very uh, prescient and omnipresent in our today's world with economic, ecological, social challenges, geopolitical ones, 
this is a big change that is everywhere. And I think it's speeding up. And it's become urgent to bifurcate, to branch off, to move elsewhere now, because otherwise we'll be facing danger now. In this context, in this biennial, is to question the general public, to show how, the, how design can help us in these delibera deliberations, allowing us to test out new pathways concretely in a day-to-day -day mobility, clothing production, and so forth. Now, this is not just reserved for designers, not just for those in the know. This biennial is for everybody, open to all, four months long this year, so that one can explore these bifurcations. And we're all invited to change the, our way of looking at the future thanks to design. Today, we all know in the dozens of years to come, we, the decades to come, we must change our habits, we must change the way we live in our organizations. Now, perhaps the big challenge is for everybody to become a player instead of being subjected to this. So a player of these changes, we need to bifurcate collectively. In other words, we have to have a generalized awareness at the, since the beginning, the beginning of the centru century has been denoted by this collective and individual awareness. This has inspired our teams here. This theme of bifurcations, the next step is to change it into actions. Now, before that, we really have to take time to explore new avenues for a more sustainable world. And this is exactly what we are suggesting to you for this 2022 biennial. There's a great example of friends and colleagues and, and, and kin who really changed things radically in this new life framework, life context. Maybe they've, they've, they've gone off to raise goats in the Larzac area. But anyway, they have bifurcated many people and questioned their lives going back to the essentials. That's what we're talking about now, to make choices that bring us to concentrate and focus on what is of essence. Changing our bifurcations instead of being subjected to them, it's wonderful. It means imagining the future of our society. Now, in this totally optimistic state of mind, the biennial is dealing with this bifurcation theme. And in this state of mind, in this theme, the Cité du Design is changing. As you know, perhaps you've heard, the Cité du Design is now undergoing a second phase of its, phase of its life. Well, I call it Design 2025. This is going to rethink the hosting of all of these audience, uh, of all of these general public who coming into this lovely city of design for the school. These are the brand new premises, the enlarged premises of the school, and this is the first part of this very far-reaching job site. New ex uh, exhibition rooms, new workrooms and, and uh, workshops for the students, and then there will be a second phase with um, a, a reception for startups and innovative companies that will be hosted on this creative um, city to design. We're going to work on innovation via design, that we want to work on materials and skill sets so as to develop all innovative projects of companies that are based anchored in this territory and nationally and internationally here and now through design. And very strong ambitions as well uh, facing the general public. Very important for this biennial, but also in the day-to-day -day life of the city design to open more and more to people, especially children, with a, a special effort that was began a, a few months ago, the Galerie du Design as well, with the National Center of Plastic. Black our plastic. So this will be a place for the storytelling of design that is continual. And then new ex uh, ex uh, show areas, new exhibition areas, and great new des des destinations for the general public with a restaurant and other places to welcome people here. This place really has to be a living and breathing thing. So. Here's the dimensions we're developing for students and companies and the general public. I think 200 million euros investment. It's a big investment that Gael Perlio wanted. So this really says a lot for our territory and design and its ambitions nationally and the positioning of Saint-Étienne in this context. Now, that's for our bifurcation. Now, let's talk about your and our collective bifurcations. Now, have a marvelous biennial for these four months and a lovely conference this morning.
Bonjour. Euh, Hi everybody, euh, ladies and gentlemen. J'ai le plaisir d'accueillir Olivier Perico. It's really a pleasure for me to welcome Bonjour. Olivier Perico, who's really behind so much in this biennial. And uh, we've been uh, able to benefit from an additional year to prepare this biennial in under very tough conditions, nonetheless. Olivier Perico is a designer. He's director of the research uh, pool for the Cité du Design for this 12th biennial. So the scientific director. Now I want to start with this, Olivier Perico. You, you did not bifurcate. Did, you did not branch off this subject of bifurcation. You chose even before this situation of pandemic occurred. So you've been able to pinpoint its uh, relevance. And so you didn't have to bifurcate your biennial. Now why? Well, we changed things a little bit, nonetheless. We started out in an enthusiastic idea about this idea of bifurcation because this is a concept that is often mentioned by designers, change, paradigm shift, and do look at things differently. So when this is the way we looked at the project from the start. And then the COVID incident, as you call it, Uh, meant that we all experienced something on a worldwide scale. It was an extraordinary experience, if you can put it that way. And we, we just realized that as designers, we're very, very little tiny beings and we're not that important. And then we were also out of work at that during that period of time. The world continued nonetheless to, nonetheless to revolve during this time. So we kind of re-looked at our way of addressing this theme. So we didn't take a big branching off, but we took a quick, a small bifurcation, and there are subtle radical radicalities that have changed. And this is basically where this is going to change. We're no longer in big, strong design a trend or avenue that from the beginning of the, the 1970s or whatever, where objects were imposed themselves, and it was very ostensory. We've seen a lot of small projects. And you had, we took, we, one needs to take time to look at these projects. This is what one experiences, these various s options and selections. Little by little, you changed and organized and suggested different things for all of these uh, exhibits. Yeah. It's a biennial with a curators or commissioners and each Each person had their own individual ideas. Sometimes these ideas are a bit contradictory from one show to the next, one exhibit to the next. So we wanted to have a whole series of proposals on the hand to get an emergence of, emergence of highly differing things, to see design as a method rather than seeing it as being the fabrication or production of uh, an object. So looking more at methods that preserve and support various illustrations. And this is the way one can change a little bit on the, 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 the definition of design to move away just from this object in a context and to, to look at it as an element of a system that's got its ramifications and branching. That's a very important aim, especially if you look at in terms of you know the wider audiences, that design boils down not just to simply a final object, objects that you find in an exhibition that tell a story, but rather show that design is first and foremost a design, its processes. And so these exhibitions together have this collective uh, aim and they've taken great care to show what is not necessarily easy to illustrate in terms of sonography. You know, they've really tried to show the different processes and really bring out the method here. Absolutely. What we did was that we invited Uh, historians who've got a very specific way of presenting information and presenting their exhibitions. And we also work with, for example, Museal people who have been working in museums, who have specific codes that they know off by heart already. So that's one specific 
uh, approach. And at the same time, we had other approaches from designers. So people who, designers who work on board companies, for example, so who are able to act as a designer, but also to act in different ways, because they can see how it works within a company, have, the, have a look at the process. And at the same time, we've had other approaches, which were had a great selection of people who spent a lot of time bringing out many different objects and thought of very different ways of showing them and displaying them. For example, we worked with student designers, uh, and you'll find their work in some of the exhibitions, and they've got a very specific way of looking at things, because what's interesting is that throughout the COVID period, nobody gave up. Everybody kept thinking about different methods, different ways of developing, and indeed, indeed thinking into the future post-COVID. You know, it really worked on people's imaginations, and people questioned all of those processes during the pandemic. So during this conference today, obviously, it's going to be broken down into three different parts. We're going to focus on a quite a, an interesting set of different exhibitions our key exhibitions here, and we'll be talking about those later. And you mentioned a few earlier, and indeed you, you know, are on board and you are a curator of one of those exhibitions, and we'll talk about that also with Anne Chagnolo. Maybe you'd like to say something, Olivier Perricot, to conclude this opening part about the decisions that you made to ensure that this Biennale will be able to be more durable, last longer into the future. And, you know, what have you learned through this period that we've just been through, which was a period in which you had to, had to be possibly more modest, you know, in terms of your approach, uh, be more coherent, more practical. And what does that mean? That means at the same time spending more time to be able to you know, go back to the drawing board and start again, to be very rigorous and to be really sure you've grasped the full potential of all the different propositions. I'm not saying it's a statement that we're, we're more modest, it's, it's a fact. I think that's where we all are here. We've got many propositions here that are really working on that notion of being subtle, modesty, paring things down. And that is a whole new generation of designers who are really focusing on this notion of paring things down to what are the needs of society. And they're highly sensitive to that issue. So four months of the Biennale, yes, we wanted to see it as four months as being time to go back, really take the time to go back to the Biennale. You know, we've had to, we're, we're tracing and, and, and creating, a, if you like, a, a map of a very long period since we all saw each other, last saw each other. And I think for society as a whole, it's important to ask that question, to stop and take stock and debate and talk about these different proposals that have come to the fore. There's nothing that's definitive here that we're showing you. What we're here to do is to experiment together, to think together, to look at our environments. And it's a very political angle that we're taking here. It's a political questioning that we are putting forward here. Thank you, Olivier Pericot. And now we're going to move on to the first section of this conference where we're going to go more into the subject. We're going to ask Yann Kazik to come and join me on the stage. Duzan Kazik. But before we begin, I'd just like to, to say that I'm absolutely delighted that the newspaper that we set up, I think, three or four years ago, which is associated with the Biennale, AOC, it really brings us together into this environment of design, and it very much is in the mindset of the Biennale. And we both agreed from the starting point that it was important to have a meeting area, a platform, where people can draw together all their different approaches and bring different sectors, it could be the social side, the historical side, but also art and creation, all coming together to debate and dialogue. And I think we're at a moment in time where there's a great deal of de reciprocity between all these different environments, you know, that science is going towards creative arts and vice versa. You know, I think it's particularly pronounced at the moment, and I think what's happening in society at the moment means that it's the right context for a great crossroads, and design is the most obvious hub, if you like, of those crossroads of those different trends. So when we began speaking together, all the different teams working on the Biennale, to be able to flesh out how we wanted to design this edition, who we would invite, whether we would invite a researcher to come and speak about the notion of bifurcation, what happened 
happened very quickly, and I thought about a book that I'd read a little while only before, and it was a book written by Juzan Kazik, and I'd like to thank him very much for coming here today. And he released, he published this book very recently. Thank you very much for being here with us, Duzan. And his book is called uh, "When the Quand les plantes n'en font qu'à la tête," when the plants do as they wish. So he's been working uh, on a, an extremely important thesis, which he actually began before the pandemic. And I actually met Duzan during the pandemic. It was through an article that he'd wrote, written on AOC, where he was questioning why is this pandemic is giving us this opportunity uh, to bifurcate. So he was studying the different branching outs that we see uh, in, in, in life, but also in his own personal life, because he grew up in what we call uh, ex-Yugoslavia, where, of course, there was the war, and, uh, and we're celebrating today, 30 years since uh, the war in former Yugoslavia, so that brought you from Yugoslavia here to live in France 22 years ago. So that's a first branching out, and it's a pretty big one. And there were other bifurcations in uh, Duzan Kazik's life. So, for example, he moved towards this work in research and focusing on a subject which is... It's not very clear, you know, you went through various different strains before you focused on what you really wanted to look at. So you had a very wide uh, basis when you arrived. And then there was one particular bifurcation, uh, and it was centered around the 17th century, and it was central to his work, and so central that we actually can't see it anymore. And that is what we call how we entered into the economy with a capital E. That again uh, was uh, a bifurcation. It began with the agricultural revolution, or the changes in agri agriculture, and it was a key moment in history. And as, it, as I say, it's so key that we don't see it anymore. And then we look at the pandemic, and through the pandemic we realize that once again, uh, as Bruno Latour would say, another uh, researcher would say, it's a time again in history to de-economize, that means break it down, go back uh, into a, another direction and have a more global overview. And I'm going to hand over uh, to Duzan Kazik to give us more on his view. Thank you very much. So hello to you all. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the Biennale and thank you, Sylvain, for this wonderful invitation to speak with you here today. And I'm delighted to be taking part in this inauguration ceremony, especially because the theme of this particular edition is bifurcation. It's a good thing because my research work focuses on bifurcation. If you see it as being abandoning a certain direction to adopt a new direction. So my bifurcation is focused on the fact that production in the past and how we live in this, uh, this world today is in connection with other living beings. And in this new bifurcations, us humans can no longer live on the economic model that we have today. So we cannot continue to prosper as we would hope. But don't worry, I'm not saying I'm going to bring you all back to cavemen, hunting and living in trees. Don't you worry. No. My objective is this, is to de-economize after 250 years of economizing our society. And why? Because it was the subject of modern science that pushed us, pushed us in this direction. And so my book focuses on a world where there is no production and no economy. So, more specifically, this work focuses, focuses on our relationship with plants and to break away with the production paradigm. paradigm sorry. So that means, this is what I'm laying out here, is mapping out the theory of this new world in which we can move and head towards. So, it's a very ambitious project, I agree, but I think the world today is asking us to be ambitious and to explore all possible an avenues. Yet, I'm aware that the current context that we see today and we're talking about Ukraine here, is closing down at the moment uh, our possibility of creating this new world. It means that we're going to have to change our direction because of this war in Ukraine. However, nonetheless, it will show us in concrete terms to what degree we, we are we have a shared dialogue in terms of production and how social sciences and left-wing politics have trapped us in terms of the economy, which means that 
every time we talk so every time we bring it into the political political debate debate moralizing arguments come into play so what i'm trying to do is bring it back to living beings and talk about the possibilities in terms of ecology you probably have all noticed that the price of uh, wheat, rice, everything has been going up and up during this war period because of what's happening in Ukraine. And obviously, Ukraine is a very key agricultural area, one of the key areas in Europe today. So we're worried that if food shortage, especially in Africa where there's a huge dependency, is this is a big worry to gay. With big worry today and so many uh, unionists are fighting and what we need to do is to work with our lobbyists to break down the politics of agriculture uh, what we call from farm to plate why because we want to make farming a little bit more ecolo ecological so that means if you look at cur current discourse we need to produce more but po the problem is is that current your environmental regulations stop that increased production so what do we need to do we need to find food sovereignty so so as to avoid famine that's the equation it seems logical and Macron, the French president, recently said that we need to have an agricultural system that produces more. That means putting to one side the environmental aspect. So that means the, for, the, food, uh, the food sector at the moment is twisting and turning in all directions. It's so confused. But the environment, and we're talking about politics here and the left-wing politics, are creating a trap in terms of protecting the environment. So we need to produce in a different way that, that there's a shift from arable farming uh, to livestock and we need to, we need to eat less meat, obviously. We need to move away from industrial production methods. methods. But again, we fall into the trap of it being a moralizing debate. So we are hedged in on every side. And again, there's a left and right wing debate at the center of this equation. So, to avoid all of this impasse, if you look at food production, I'd like to say that I've just spent uh, a week in the Bosse region. And it, they, they are accused in that area of being productivist for various reasons. So, I went to see uh, all these crop farmers here. Uh, you know, it wasn't an accident during doing this during the war period, but I went to go there and I went to a, fa a farm called Lange Colanta. So, he's got 550 hectares of crop farms. It's a huge surface. You can't imagine how big it is. So, he's got a So, I asked him how he was uh, farming his wheat, and this is what he said. Everybody I quote what he says, everybody treats wheat as just being an every old object. It's considered to be a raw material. But see what happens with the war in Ukraine. But, but others treat it as a production uh, commodity. But, but wheat is a plant, it grows in the field. And I don't know why there's such a difference between, difference between those who work within the farming sectors and those outside the farming sectors. Why do they have such different visions? So there's an, uh, André Mathieu is another farmer in the Bosse region. So he has 304 uh, hectares of wheat farm, so a, a large surface. So again, he's treated as being uh, a producer of raw materials. The problem is, is that the wheat mills do not the treat them as being raw material. So again, it's got a very different perspective from different people within the sector. And again, there is different perspective in terms of yield, but us, in our own lives, we know that this discourse is complete rubbish and that it's a, there's a different reality. And I think, I think that everything could work if all of the right conditions were put in, pla put in place. So, the wheat is not an object. The field is not a factory. We need to think of it in the right way. Our country depends on wheat farming. 
and we can't compromise that system. That is a fact. So here we are today. We're at the very center of the de of debate between left-wing and right-wing politics, what, how people see farming on the inside and how people see the process from the outside. So how do I see farming? I want to be able to illustrate this interdependency between people who work the land and the plant that they're working with, the plant form. So it, there is an urgency to, urgency to organize ourselves where we see production as the own possible future. And I, as individuals, we can only see our future as working if we evolve in unison with the plants and the crops that we're developing. So I used, I drew on a survey that was carry out, carried out about the relationship between those who work the land, farmers, and the crops, and this was in Fla France. And what I noticed is that farmers are never in a production, in inverted commas, relationship with their farms. They're more thinking in terms of co-domestication. That means working in unison with their plants. So they tame, if they like, they master. Uh, they, they are able to grasp how they work with their crops, but it works in the other direction. The crop actually determines the life of the farmers. Again, if the, the, the problem with farmers is they can never go on holiday. They are, they are bound to their farms. So there's this codependency between man and plant. So they have, uh, so, so what we're saying is that uh, the farmers and the farm uh, with men and women are dependent upon the crop farming. So once again, we mustn't see crops as objects of con uh, consumer objects, as something that we just eat. We need to think about different ways of viewing plants. Obviously, we eat them. It's a source of, uh, of food for our diets. So what I wanted to illustrate is how farmers work with the land, how there is a sense of dominance, how they speak and communicate with the plants, how they play with each other, how they help each other. So what I tried to show is there are different tr different types of plants and different ways in which being in unison, um, working together with the plants of the land. So we must not see them as inert animal, for sorry, not animals, inert objects as many people do today, but rather as living organisms, living things, working together with farmers. So we need to go back to the beginnings of this debate where we got on the one side farmers and the elite on the other side, other side. the elite that thought they, they formed agriculture by developing new economic models. And what I'd like to show through my work, so, a farmer has never produced any carrot or tomato, but rather we, th we live thanks to plants. So that means plants in the singular and plural. So, what I want to argue or present in my book is that capitalism and socialism, two different models, two different regimes, look like opposing systems, but in fact, they are simply two faces of the same coin. Why? Because they have a very common baseline history on their view towards production and eco economy. Their view is that man cannot live without the land. So, for example, in Cuba and in the West, everybody agrees. So, we want to focus on where or which particular regime can we produce and work in farming and this is the case in Russia, for example. There, they agree on the question that you need to produce wheat. There's no debate. They don't talk about how to live with or without wheat. And that's a completely different thing. For them, it's a given that you need to produce. And the thing is that we're stuck in this infernal alternative equation where we need to protect the environment but what we need to be able to do is to live with other human, being, other, other human beings. We use farming and we see capitalism on the one hand and liberalism on the other, other hand. And we need to, often we see food as an inert resource, but we need to see it as being a binding factor that link 
human beings with each other. So it's not an object, but it's a link. It's a living link between us all. So the ecological disaster we find ourselves in today is forcing us with greater urgency to really work on this subject and to be able to adapt to different climates. So we must no longer see food and plants as this inert raw material, but to give it back the power that it deserves. So we need to be in link, in symbiosis with other human beings and see it as a resource and no longer as merchandise. And what we're doing to do, we at the moment, we are destroying our world. We're working on our own disappearance, but also the disappearance of other species in the world. How can we save ourselves? How is it possible if we put production first before our relationships amongst each other? It's an impossible equation. So we will continue to produce and produce and produce. That means to destroy until the point where we will then finally understand what we have done. And then we're going to have to live with that world, that world that we're creating around us. But it'll be too late for us and too late for other species. When human sciences and e e environmentalists who are pro as you can see in Ukraine, who are pro the notion of independence in terms of farming production. When we're not looking at research anymore, we're not, in theory, we're moving into practice, we're finding new models, different infrastructures, similar to Marxism. And yet, behind this productivism, there is not what we call the right level of production. So the question is between producing or living with this new and different world. Now, the modern sciences will say that there's a real materiali materiality of our world. This is linked to humans, this concept of pollution is just an economic exploitation of resources, of course, via capital and by work. Now, this is p imposed on all the sectors, industry, commerce, uh, the agriculture, uh, research. Yes, this agricultural product and even research, well, how did this happen? I, we can't live without production, too. In 1759 is the, is, is, the, is the really turning point. Now there was a rural tableau that was very well known in, that sh without even taking into account the, uh, the farmers, it says that our agriculture produces wealth and other sectors are sterile and unproductive. So this is a fundamental statement. This leads the economy in the, in the wealth of nations to, 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 uh, to further this idea of the wealth of nations affirmed at the firm afterwards. This is Adam Smith who said this. So the other sectors are productive and they create wealth as well. This effort of demonstration Concerning production, is it's central and it's tr it's applicable to all sectors. Now another step has been taken, and humans produce to live in society, and this actually will have an impact on all of mankind. Now, by writing this, Adam Smith or others say this production is li is linked to human. Humanity. So everybody believes in this, and then the left and the right. In the 19th century, didn't, we're trying to figure out who was going to be detaining the uh, the channels of production, whether it be the state or whether individuals. So production constitutes our raw material, and we cannot live without economy or without economizing. So to what's happening today, we get confused all the time between the discipline of economy with a big E that was intrinsic, 
with economy that I write with a small e that describes this invented space that was invented at the same time with the uh, big E economy linked to, the po to politics and sciences. This is in Marxist doctrine drawn, seen as being influent uh, outside of society. And these neoliberal cons concerns so we're, they're basically just trying to figure out from what origin this production will come. So the uh, essential of the trap on the left, I suggest that we say whether the economists be from the right or left, we need to start with a clean slate and look at things differently post-pandemically. The, the, the right is what? But the left is continuing to work on this economy as a discipline because they've got this same economic narrative arc. Today, all of the economic stories need to describe economic realities. Now, concretely, the left and believes that companies produce goods and believe that humans are the only beings that work in this world and think that uh, production is equal to class and uh, talking about free markets and they can't change anything as long as they believe that the economy is like this. The reason that the, why they l that the left is diminishing. This is why I say in my book, well, you have to take an anthropological look at this to understand it all. Now, if you no longer believe in ecology, you won't have any idea what's going on in the world. You have to move away from this economic prism. It doesn't make sense to say that activities are company, of companies are economic activities. It's like saying company activities are anthropological activities it is, and are linked to anthropology. Some things are of economic nature. Before writing this new story, this new history, we have to confront this economic reality. This is what I do in my book with agricultural. The good news is that if one does downsize uh, economy and agriculture, we can do this with other sectors. So you have to do an epistemological displacement of things and create new narrative arcs. Now, I'm not saying this is going to be easily possible, but it's something that if uh, essence, and I thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Well, thank you so much. You said Kazik for this this uh, this really great deliberation and uh, thoughts on bifurcation and the pos the the debate of possibilities. Now we're going to continue to explore these proposals of the biennial through two round tables that are going to allow us to convene to convene commissioners, curators, and so forth. So for the first round table, here we go. Catherine Rosset, Rossi, and uh, uh, Franck Hundagala and Florian Trollet, please step up here. And I also wanted to invite you to a new link has been sent to you via email towards the translation, translation into English of what the participants will say. So perhaps you've gotten an e email link so you can connect to Vimeo using your smartphones and using your headphones, you can get this simultaneous translation into English. Thank you very much to all three of you. Catherine Rossi, she's a design historian. She teaches at the University of Kingston, next to London in the UK. Next to her, Franck Undegla, who's a designer and 
pouviez dire Catherine Rossi est l'une des trois She's one of the three co-commissioners of the the exhibit called uh, at home. So Franck Undegala and Florian Trollet who works on R&D at Salomon and for uh, the biennial he designed the, uh, the dépliage, folding unfold and the front Franck de, de Gala is singular pluriel. So now maybe we could, you've heard talk about the different approaches to design this morning so that this bi biennial has suggested rolling out. Now among these approaches, there is one approach that is fundamental. It's a must have. This is the historical approach that needs to be taken so that we can reposition today's uh, design in, into this past history, anchor it into history. And this is what you have adapted for the exhibits at home, for example, at home. So maybe you're going to want to explain the challenges of this to us. Thank you, Kat. So, at home is uh, an explanation of you know, yesterday, the past, present, and future. And design. I did this with Jana Scholz and Penny Spark. I bet. Oh, but we parle en anglais. We explore the meanings of the home through five different concepts. La maison, the idea the of utopia, a shelter or a free or uh, abri, identity, well-being and sustainability. Et and we think about how design and architecture um, relate to all these things. Uh, I'll explain. I also let you explain the big challenges, the geographic challenge as well. Uh, considerable geography on uh, the level of a continent, this, this exhibit of singular plurial, singular plurals. So, could you explain this exhibit in contemporary Africa's plural is a new way of designing producing, living, <laughs> and living. It's a new way. It's proposals for new avenues to improve uh, the, the lifestyle of as many people as possible. This is part of the intention, and especially it's located between adaptation and more global transformation of territories. Therefore, when one talks about territory, talking about the African territory, there are questions raised to figure out whether it's the, the continent is so re recognizable that it's been given this identity, but rather it's a visual accident, a gr geographic accident that corresponds to a reality. That's why I talk about contemporary Africas, because it's a way of showing this great diversity of practices, diversity of contexts, geographic, cultural, context and to show as well that localized uh, projects emit, des, des emit certain, send out certain signal, signals that can be pertinent locally but uh, can be of interest elsewhere so it's a way of kind of uh, uh, kind of layering uh, leveling out things to have exchanges between the from elsewhere in the world in Africa and vice versa. And Florian, what approach is this? So, dépliage unfolding. A whole series of ex exhibits that take place throughout the entire biennial that show how designers work. And when production stopped, when the plants were closed, we had some extra time in some companies on the Rhone Alp, in the Rhone Alp territory and throughout France as well, and even in the world to think more f fully about the way we were working, maybe to think about changing certain things. And therefore, it's a whole connect collection of different initiatives that I got from various colleagues that I discovered as well. 
When I was setting up this collection of 40 works of art, this allowed me, myself, to better understand my profession. People who will come and see this show to the biennial will understand this profession better as well. To what extent were you impacted by you know these current events? I'm talking about the pandemic, basically. To what extent have you kind of allowed this current news to configure your deliberations? Of course, when you're a researcher or a story, you are anchored in the long, the long term course of things. And this is almost the opposite of current news. But when things that happen so totally, such as a pandemic, it's hard to not react, isn't it? Especially since you were direct, you're maybe directly involved because Yes. Absolutely. So we, um, the concept of the home came to us just before the pandemic, um, but it's and COVID is is one of the very current issues that we deal with, and actually the climate emergency is is running through exhibition about so it's, as well. So it's very interesting to hear your discussion. Puddle. Um, so history is important to us. We kind of realised coming here that actually we do provide this particular historical perspective. And so throughout the exhibition, we use objects from the past, but also c contemporary design mixed together. And on the one hand, that offers us a kind of long view of some themes that have been there for, for a long time, but maybe the, the pandemic brought to light. And one of those would include the importance of nature in the home, actually, in terms of the presence of plants, which we might think of as a particular trend um, today. But actually, the exhibition kind of rejects the idea of uh, trends. That's one of our bifurcations, is that we're moving away from the importance of the home um, in that sense. So we understand that, that plants have been key to the well-being, our psychological, our mental, our physical well-being in the home for quite some time. Um, but also we think about issues um, of working from home, for example, um, and how the home during COVID really transformed from a place of, of refuge for most of us, but also into one of, of education, of, of an office, of a gym, of all these other functions. And one of the things I would say about the exhibition pardon, is that we're very um, conscious that we're all the experts in the home. We all live in our homes. So what we do as curators is that we try to articulate and we try to help us question and show how designers have been questioning and reflecting on some of those ways that we think about the home. So you... So there's these current events yeah, about the pa pandemic, but I, of course there's also this question of central issue of climate, climate change. I imagine this is a, just a, a great interest because you've worked in such different contexts in Africa. And today what is the role of a, a designer's approach given this? Well, in the exhibit, to give you a general idea, we, talk, we look at forestry practices, we look at agricultural practices, uh, transmission of skills, mobility, construction, and yes, this question, this issue, it crosses through it all, it tra transverses it all, and all of these points of work. The proposals that one sees in the exhibit, for example, or the design of big forestry infrastructures or even the smaller local initiatives to improve the livability of homes by having a bifurcation of construction materials, for example, using existing materials, totally existing, but transforming them from the very center, from the very core. Now, we realize that there are plenty of proposals that address this issue, but different on different scales. So what about you? I, you know, I think it's very clear that, uh, in your exhibition, uh, you know, the question of climate is very key, absolutely. 
with the body, our bodies, as a measuring tool. So the planet is made, uh, made up mainly of water, our bodies too, and that was the angle through which I entered into this exposition, the notion of resources, uh, water that's drinkable and non-drinkable. So again, these are going to be crucial uh, elements. It could be food, it could be diet, sport performance, hygiene, health and hygiene. So. That's uh, that's how I began. I use water as my entry point, and also the notion of getting dressed, what we wear, our clothes. Again, it has a function, metabolism. So the physiology of our body, and again, that is a social function. So if you look at the disappearance of certain resources, if you look at the you know certain factories, production lines that have had to close down. It's just like wheat production. It, now it's the material that designs the event. It's not the designer that designs the event. So the equation has been returned. So we're looking at what remains, what we have left, and how we can use it. So I liked what you said notion of wheat being an active living body that acts upon the lives of the farmers. And also I wanted to, to look at um, certain designers who are working. So we looked, of, looked at all the dead stock, if you like, in companies. So basically we looked at what was left on the sideline in the production lines, bring them back from the storage rooms and bring them back into production. And again, a final part of my exhibition uh, was how that we moved within lockdown. How do we keep our body in action and more recently Recently, oh, sorry, uh, the exhibition ends on a very positive note. We talked about how there are many interesting ways of using uh, designers. It can be, you can use the body and the lockdown as a springboard to new and better things. A question for all three of you. As Duzon Kazik said, he realized to what degree we're living in a world where economy obviously is very important and the discipline that is imposed upon us through the economy. And this has been expressed in many different ways through our body, for example, our relationship with space, you know, many different aspects. But at the same time, we know that it indicates the divisions that you find in logic and the workspace in specifications or specialisms. So there are gaps that you see uh, forming. And here at this BNL, you discover that design is in fact a place which resists this notion of being specialized. No, it shows itself or reinforces that the principle of curiosity with the world is something very important, that you go out to the world and you look at all the different disciplines. You don't just focus on one. You don't go one down one little track, particular track. So if you like, design is a place, it's a crossroads between all these different specialist fields. And we don't need to come down on one line and choose, no. It gives us or it leads on to other spaces, other potentials, other capacities to identify other uh, forking off points. So different bifurcations. So we're no longer focused on one particular economic discipline, but we have a wider view. And I think what we could do is see design as this crossroads of seeing these different approaches coming together. Is that the specific, uh, do you think that design plays that role, each of you? I think in terms of our exhibition, we, we include um, works from design, but also we include artists, architecture, craft. We understand design as actually a multidisciplinary design uh, process, uh, kind of medium. But also within certain works, you see how designers really understand the world in different kinds of ways and bring in issues of um, legislation, bring in issues of, of, of policy and bring in issues of economy. And actually one of the first exhibits we have in the exhibition is a film by an American artist called Marta Rosler from the 1980s. And she puts this question that, that we really shouldn't have to have as a question, which is whether housing is a human right. And she shows how, uh, this was a question she asked in the 1980s in America, and she shows how actually we need to ask this question because unfortunately homelessness was an issue then and in fact it's getting worse and worse as we all know now. And at the same time she shows, she uses very clearly that the visual language of design to show that um, the funding has been going down and down and down um, in that time period. So you can see that designers are, are very kind of understand that we live in a complex world that you need to have this literacy in all these other subjects to really empower design to deal with the world as it is. Frank. 
Oui. oui. À titre personnel, je suis partisan de la déspécialisation. Being speaking, I'm uh, very much into the notion of despecialization, especially in terms of design. It's a discipline in itself. I think it's something which can be designed or seen in a very transversal way. You know, they are discipli disciplined, if you like, as designers. But again, their aim is to use that where they are as a starting point and to go out into the world. So they are specialists of themselves, if you like, within the context of design. And as for our exhibition, I'm going to give you two examples of what we're showing at this Biennale. We show two prosthetic limbs. One is bionic and one is uh, for, um, for facial restructuring surgery. And we show... Uh, what happens to the body after an accident or illness, so there's the repair side, there's a very mechanical functional size, but also there's the aesthetic rebuilding of the body. So on the one hand you've got function, on the other hand form and aesthetic. So we are giving a, a limb the ability to come back to life, to be used again, but also to give that part, body part, or indeed the whole person, uh, self-confidence, dignity, and aesthetic uh, regeneration. So these artificial limbs or artificial grass, grafts were made by designers, and their way of designing, their methods, you know, are very much centered in uh, the design school. So we work with a mechanical engineer, so he's more on the science side. And also in this project, we're working with a, an old, uh, a former, sorry, uh, makeup artist with special, expect, uh, special effects from Nigeria that has worked on creating, you know, fake bodies, fake corpses for films. So we brought all these people together, those who make artificial limbs, makeup artists, you know, mechanical engineers. So everything is mixed together and you can find ingredients within one point. So you can find professionals that have a design vein in their work, but also designers who have that capacity to go out and mix with other fields such as researchers, architects, or people in human sciences. So that's the, the, the wealth of our discipline in design. We're really on every axis. So as an integrated designer, it's very important to focus on different subjects. You have to have a certain degree of specialization to understand and to be able to share. So I'm looking at an opposite approach here, which is to spend time on your trade. And today I work on shoes with Salomon and I've been working on them for a very little time so far. And what I'm trying to understand is what shoes do to us and what we do to shoes. So this interaction between humans humans and objects, and also I'm studying the issue of bifurcation in shoes. What is it? So using recycled material is very easy. All designers and creators can do it, and designer, it's very available. You can find it everywhere. However, creating recyclable objects is difficult. We don't know how to do it yet. And if we only use recycled objects as we see today, which is what people are doing in companies today, we're going to again run out of stock of that particular material. We're going to reach uh, this paradoxical situation in certain companies or that produce clothes that they're sometimes they're using fake plastic bottles that have never had water in them that they're going to use to create this we've recycled plastic bottles label. So this is the paradox and it exists. It's a reality today. So if we want to move away from that approach, that means designers have to specialize themselves to know exactly how to make, for example, a, a pair of shoes, how many different components ne are needed, what are the ingredients and the raw materials, what can we pare down, what can we intensify, Obviously, you have to look at the notion of comfort, which you all hold so dear, comfort in your feet, at the same time ensuring that you can use those shoes for a certain degree of kilometers. And again, we're trying to use recyclable materials here. But these are materials that can be recycled in a second life. Thank you very much. We didn't talk about the notion of producing recycled materials as a, as a very key example of uh, this economy we referred to earlier. It's very interesting. Thank you very much to all three of you. Now we're going to move on to our second um, roundtable discussion. We'll be looking at yet more issues of design method. So, now I'd like to invite up onto the stage Ernesto Oressa, Sophie Penn, Benjamin Gringor-Dorge, sorry, Olivier Pericot, and Anne Chagnolot.
Alors justement, euh, euh, on, on va. So, on a trois nouvelles we've got three new exhibitions here that we're going to talk about, and this time I think we're going to go more into the into detail. Do come, come close. We're going to talk more about method, design method, design as a method. So I'd like to begin with Ernesto Orosa. You know, it's, it's wonderful. We, the key word of this conference is pr production in the middle of production. What do you understand by the word production in that context, Ernesto? What does production mean to you? I'm design researcher, and for me, uh, production is, is a link to the production of knowledge. And I'm trying to use my practice to engage with community, to talk with others, to learn from others, and use our practice to uh, disseminate, to, dif to, to, to engage with the community and to transport this information to others. Then for me, pr production in this case, in this exhibition, is production of knowledge. Donc c'est assez différent de la production entendue au sens économique du terme, même si c'est le, le, le même mot. Mais quel, quel, est, quel a été l'enjeu de, de, cette, de cette exposition que vous avez conçue conçu sur le Yves, euh, that ici was designed dans cette école here within the school because you are obviously a design professor here in the school. And so what was your what was your approach here? Producing Asimut is a journal of design research that we are producing here for 30 years. And when uh, the general curator of the Benal asked me to work about production, I decided to, uh, to about the condition of production today, I decided to uh, create conditions in our space to uh, sustain a program of activity that we will have for four months, bringing uh, here designers, artists, architects, to talk about production today, about the role of designer in society today, and questioning production. We are putting question production, but we are doing that from the point of view of design research. On va peut-être passer la, la parole à Sophie uh, Penn. Hand over the mic to Sophie Penn. Can you tell us, Sophie, with Benjamin Grandange as well, what did you want to do? What were you seeking to achieve with your exhibition, uh, with your exhibition Le Monde Sino Rien, The World or Nothing, especially because you're working very closely with the students. Le Monde ou Rien, The World or Nothing, means that we, that means that the, there is no way up to heaven anymore. Everything is blocked. So the students at Saint-Étienne here of ESED and also the Learning Planet Institute, they came up with this title two years ago when we started working together on the exhibition for this biennale. And obviously, you can sense that the generation today have deep dis de sense of despair, especially in 2019 with the climate march when they came out into the streets. And we didn't maybe listen to them enough at the time. And obviously, in the last two years, this has become even more entrenched. And this melancholy, this despair has a great deal of belief in it and is a real belief in creation. And also we can hear, but not quite so much at the, at the moment, this, this hope. So the aim of this exhibition is to give the young generation a platform, uh, which is a breakaway. It's very mutant, if you like. It's very different to us today. They have this new energy of this notion of what a new space will be. They know that creation is all they have left. And it's on the one hand, innovation, technical innovation, or little innovations and changes. And we worked with Benjamin Grandorge, and what we did is look to really indicate these different levels of inten intensities. Because we work with the students here in Saint-Étienne, but also the Learning Planet, but also with other students in Reims, Uri, at the, at the George Pompidou Centre, many different students. So this is the beginning of a network. What we want to do is to use the notion of the Bauhaus of the living being. The Bauhaus of tomorrow is not necessarily about materials, but rather our relationship with living being. That's what the youth uh, wants today. That's why uh, when you were saying Duzen Kazik uh, earlier on, it's so in interesting because they know that they will not have a second planet to live on. So what we wanted to do is that as of now, 
What's happening in uh, schools today and everything that's happening in the wings around this notion of living beings is that we're trying to build this design of transition. That's what's happening right now and that will pave us to the future. Ben Benjamin, Sophie Penn, you uh, teach at the Learning uh, Planet Institute and you, Benjamin, you worked on the scenography of this particular exhibition. You are a lecturer at the ESAD. Yes, what we wanted to do with the scenography is to create a territory. So those who come to see the exhibition will see that you have a kind of imaginary realm, this territory. And this territory represents what we can't see, but what students can see through their own projects. So it's the youth vision, the young. So as curators, you know, we were very firm about our position. We didn't want to get too involved because we don't know anymore. We no longer uh, have a role, if you like, to play. Because the graduation project of the students is to have a kind of mapping out of the students and what their future will be. So what we did was to give them a kind of protective uh, field or film where uh, the the students and the gra their graduations uh, their graduation pro uh, projects will show us the old generations where is the path the bifurcation to the future so uh, you uh, Anne Chenelieu you uh, set up this other you curated this exhibition autofiction with Olivier Pericot earlier on Duzan Kazik turned about the notion of storytelling and the importance of rewriting history is I know that's something very important to you storytelling absolutely yes I'm going to hand over the microphone to Olivier because I'm afraid I lost my voice yesterday. So I'm terribly sorry. I hope he'll be able to do a good job in explaining. So I'm going to keep an eye on him to ensure he represents our project well. Absolutely. I would have preferred Anne to speak, but there we go. So uh, we've worked very closely together. I've got a little bit more voice than Anne does, so I will explain. Yes, this exhibition is giving a biography of an object and the object that we have chosen is a very important one because we have 1.2 billion uh, million car users in the world today you know cars are everywhere 1.2 billion that was the figure in 2020 you know all species and all beings are moving uh, forward but th the car is the the object that you find the most across the world so our focus here was to to say there are many different stories to be told about the car, the automobile. And what's interesting is to share all those stories, share those, share those narratives, have a debate and dialogue about them, and to offer the visitor a kind of technical democracy. That means, come here, you, you're going to see the documentation, you can see the research, and the designer comes into play to delegate part of the work, delegate part of that thought process to you, the visitor. So. We're using our know-how as designers to, if you like, showcase, give a platform, organize the information, uh, to be able to share and communicate about the different objects and share the, uh, see how the different objects communicate amongst each other. Ernesto, earlier on you talked about the notion of production and you said that what, in, what interests you is the production of knowledge. And we also said earlier on that yes, design for all the specialists here today it's clear uh, we know what design is but for you know for the mainstream audiences they think it's just an object obviously it doesn't boil down either to knowledge alone so design has a role to play in the way in which that knowledge is produced so the methods that you roll out to produce that knowledge is that what interests you about design oui. I'm now working as a teacher and I'm trying to, to, every time when I'm confronting a project, I'm trying to understand the logic of the project and I'm involved in this case is education. And we are creating together methodologies to, to work with the students, to teach and to, and, to, and to bring this conversation to our practice every day. Then, uh, yes, it's a, it depends. You are, as a designer, you are working in industry, you need to understand the language of the machine that you are developing, the vocabulary of the machine. If you are teaching, you need to understand how we can uh, explore and experiment, uh, produce experimentation in the school to incentivate the, the, the experimentation, the research with the students. For me, it's the same, the, same, the same kind of protocol. You can do it in the factory, you can do it in the school, you can do it in every, any place. You can do it in a Mikalaik, an association, you can do it in any, any, any uh, designer for me is not, not a discipline. In any case, for me, it could be something transdisciplinary. It's a practice, it's a practice. 
and is practice taking knowledge from different other fields, for ethnography, anthropology, then we are reusing this kind of tools to talk with others. Then for me, design is a, is a fluid practice that can be any place in society to produce sometimes bottles, sometimes knowledge, sometimes a common uh, agreement in society. Yeah. Sophie Penn, uh, so, Sophie Penn or whomever, c'est comment on, Benjamin, comment on enseigne, d'ailleurs je ne sais pas si c'est le bon mot, qu'est-ce qui se passe dans des écoles What's happening with the schools euh, du design uh, Schools of design, you chose to, to put references in the title of your show. Now we know that this is referring to industry, but you've talked about Bauhaus. But why did you choose to position yourself in this in this succession in this history was it to claim this succession this inheritance well Bauhaus first of all it's collective it's an ecosystem that is that is representative of its own destiny and for the students we see that this school provides a, an environment a living environment where there's so many encounters in these creative schools whether it be scientific or design schools there are relationships with the territory with companies as well Bauhaus its historical impact was that it came in in 1919 with Barnav when there was a new um, democratic space that seemed to be uh, being set up, the Weimar Republic. And so the reference to Bauhaus means that this is a European community that really launched this new Bauhaus program and we wanted to come into it. Not, not just to, uh, we wanted to talk about bifurcation, we wanted to talk about change of attitude as well and this is where things take place in schools. So. Now, for the teaching side of this, I'll give the floor to Benjamin, because I'm a designer. My main work is, my main concern is design. So, there are two reasons that I wanted to do this. Very selfishly, I needed to verify this view of the world, this energy, I don't find it alone, so I'm saying this because this, this learning curve is more a collaborative curve in this school, I think. It's a protected space, a sheltered space. Generally, I think when a young man or woman decides to, to study design or move towards design, because there's a, a, a certain comprehension or incomprehension of the world, but anyway, there's an attitude of wanting to change things. This is a framework where one comes in, maybe not destroyed, but kind of really concerned, and I think the school is a collective place. Then you've got to progress. You've got to anchor yourself in the world and to do this right. Of course, there's knowledge and know-how that needs to be learned. Once again, back to the round table earlier on, we'll, we'll never train real specialists. We just need to train people who are flexible, able to adapt, and change the tone of their language depending on who they're addressing, to whom they are addressing their, their and to what living being they're addressing their efforts as well. And I think this is something in our schools that we can teach and must teach. We also need to train people to be capable of becoming specialized, uh, to, to be precise on things, and I think this is quite important. At the end of these years of study, I'm so impressed that the students are doing something totally different, but it, they're doing it right. They've just learned to understand and perhaps reformulate the question that was originally raised. To tr it, so the specs charge is never defi de definitive, but the final one is always interesting. Olivier Pericot, perhaps a, wo a word about method, because we spoke a lot about method earlier. We can just start with the word design. That is more of, of an action that is projected. And in this projection action, 
or foreseeable, foreseeing action. It's like throwing something forward, so, or an idea, or uh, just, just throwing something in the air forward and then moving forward during this period. I think this is where this is all situated. This is where you design, imagine, you these ideas pop up, and then, then it's going to drop down this thing that you've thrown. And this it's going to strike somewhere, but, but we won't see where it's going to strike ourselves. We've thrown it forward, and it will strike. That's why design is so unusual. You have to continue to reinvent defi definitions. Now, this is evanescent. There are just multiple approaches. Now, we start by taking on, taking on something and then reinterpreting it in this biennial. We want to do this in a different way. We want to do something totally different, bifurcate. And then then f f 10 years ago, let's say, maybe that's what, was what we need to look at. Here, we're proposing methods and method is seen as a method. It, design is seen as a method, and in, within method there is creativity or creation. And it's all of these different strategies. And Ernesto Rosa, I think you co-signed an article on the question of design. This is a theoretical proposal and a new one. Can you talk about this? Sur la méthode. Sur le, le design et l'anarchie, en fait, l'anarchie dans le design. Ok, ok. Oui. Uh, yeah, ok, yes. Uh, pardon, I was a confusion because my brain is understanding French, but I have the another information I understand. for here. Uh, yes, I think, uh, as I said before, for me, the practice of design, the design is a practice, it's an open practice, and it's a practice to, to, to talk with others. We need, to op uh, we need to open the practice of design. Design research is now a practice to produce an elite of designers going in the academic field, closing the practice of design. My proposition is the practice of design research is a practice to open this conversation to the community. Then David Graber is a very important uh, ethnographer, anthropologist from England. He proposed in a little book, he proposed a kind of a description of, uh, uh, about anarchist ethnography. His proposition was, we need to learn to listen to others, because maybe there is people around us doing the things better than us. Then we need to, to produce an ethnography of this production, this practice, to put this information in some place and try to vectorize, try to, to be vectors of this information to the community. Then for me, this is, uh, this is the, the role of, and uh, there is the possibility to have this design as an anarchist practice too, but from the, from the design and research point of view. It's, it's my perception, yeah. Peut-être Sophie Penn, pour, pour terminer ces, ces, cet échange, euh, j'aimerais euh, vous poser la question de... I'd like to ask you the question of how this experimentation, the work with the students that you've done, these learning curves, and this unusual environment of the school, how can this be considered to be a, like a living lab or some kind of lab for teaching in a more general manner, for learning in a more general manner as well? In France especially, sometimes we have this disciplinary uh, distance. Now when you look at the, the presidential candidates, they talk about, in France they're talking about reinforcing fundamentals now. It's not a fantasy idea of school. We talked all the time about, during our exhibit or exhibition, about a, a school of creation, creativity. We want to distinguish between arts and sciences, and then it's the invite, invented artist whose practice tra traverses the entire uh, exhibition. In other words, working with scientists, working for observing certain barriers. We see ar uh, artists who have investigative procedures which are almost scientific in the field. And the creation schools, this is what they are. It's a school that, that are really based in pragmatism 
we're pushed by this strong concern, essential quest issues, and we're moving forward towards skills, knowledge, moving towards others in the territory. And, and intervening with the territory, we have the conviction that in, even in the more classical schools, I think that all teachers in these schools have understood that you must no longer pretend what you are doing is of greatest importance. Now, in the universities that seem to be more traditional, there's all there's a, a school of innovation and, and, and there's a space for freedom that means that you've got design that is very far reaching you've got these the traditions emerging and I think there's this exists everywhere in France. You've got to have the social side. This is part of project man the way we do project management as well, but it's also it's going to be more and more a case of changing in the future because France can no longer continue in this vein and just, vein and just ignoring what's going on. I think this is part of the presidential campaign. There's a generation that is lear learning as it's discovering and discovering as it's learning because it's uh, got this total uncertainty. So we fooled around, fooled around with this issue of transmission that is useful but nonetheless involves technical things, drawing techniques. Sometimes we, f one felt that these were a little bit boring and fastidious, but and, and, and it's not just do it yourself. It's not just being resourceful, but you're learning something here. So we did we didn't look at these processes, but if we did look at the processes, we'd perhaps see that school is where the best transition is is uh, fomenting. Thank you so much. Thank you to all five of you. And those who've lost their voice, maybe we have a little bit of time remaining. If you've got questions, or the participants of this round table, uh, for the, from the previous round tables, etc. There is a question. Listening to you, it's very interesting because what emerges, in my view, what seems obvious is the closeness or how the different experimental approaches are so close to each other and how they're towards semiotics. And it's a process that is able to reinvent itself. So I think design as a transversal discipline is very much similar to that self-perpetuating, self-creative approach. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other questions or comments in the audience? Thank you, Sophie, for handing around the mic. It's something I wanted to share with you. I really do hope that all of the company managers, whether small or big companies, will want to come to this Biennale. And I think companies have enormous need for designers. And I think schools and companies need to work together in unison to, to with this great movement that you're talking about talking about towards the living structure, the living beings, that it can be seen, understand, understood, sorry, and have a higher profile so that that can be worked on within companies across the board. Florian, do you want to add something? Trolle, because you talked about an integrated designer. I don't actually know that vocabulary. That means that you work within a company, so you're an in-house designer. Yeah, there is a lot of designers in France today who work as in-house designers and the question is what uh, are they asked to do and what do they do on a daily, daily basis? Uh, so we train, are we detrain? No, it's a very good question. What do we do? I hope that company managers will come and we'll be able to set up a dialogue with them. So what do we ask these designers in companies? Uh, do they keep quiet? Do they just you know, go, with, go with the flow or do they come out? Are they proactive? Do they give their own vision? Uh, have their trainers given them enough life and courage and confidence to say other things, to propose something else within companies? Have we been able to inculcate in them this notion of imagination? And do they have the strength to really develop that information in, com uh, sorry, imagination in companies? I hope it's the case and I hope that we'll be able to keep going and be able to keep an eye on that, keep a close eye I close eye on ensuring that our graduates uh, go into companies and use their imaginations. 
as a as a professor as a lecturer here here in Saint Etienne, I think the challenge that we have here of being in the real world and actually also what happens when you're out there in the field working is very important. Do we have a real perception of how it works? Again, I go back to the notion of protection. So with our students, we try to protect them, but at the same time is to arm them, equip them so that they can work in the right way. Are they able to discuss uh, with people within companies so, so they can follow uh, the line within companies, but also to change and be uh, engineers of change within those companies. And I think that's something that's very important. And I think Eric uh, would agree that us and all of the teaching staff here is that we're trying to move towards this notion that the school is no longer a place of debate where you just speak about the company, of industry or, produce or production. No, what we need to do is go out there in the field, either to be operators of change or indeed to improve things. And that is our role. Well, that we give them a lot of energy. We give students energy to ensure that they are they are not scared to go out there and really make their mark in reality and play roles in the real world. Hello, Elizabeth Guillon. I'm a designer, and I also work with Benjamin as as a lecturer here at Elizad. So this question affects us all. And when I arrived here at Elizad, it was three years ago. So I'd worked uh, in the professional field before then. And one of the things that really struck me as being important when I arrived here, and what's changing right now, is that designers no sh should no longer, but have become professionals that basically uh, re meet the needs of a set of specifications. And what we're seeing here with the way in which our students position themselves what they're doing is they're thinking, they're questioning, they're creating, they're creating forms of all forms, artifacts and objects that enable them to think and to they that enable them to think about what is the definition of our needs. So in terms of needs analysis, they're really changing things. They're changing uh, how designers are working because we talked about in-house designers in companies. It's very important and they play a role in terms of public politics and also what is the notion of public interest. So the question is, how can we fold designers into the wider debate more? And that's something that we really focus on in design practice. And here, when you look at the different, uh, the scope of different master degrees that we offer here at EZAD. Are there any other questions or comments? Anyone like to say anything in the audience today? No? So, I will then thank all of you today for listening and thank you for everyone who spoke today for all of your comments, everything you brought to today's uh, session. Thank you very much to you all. Goodbye.